Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A little girl named Sissy was riding her bike one day, riding along the sidewalk, and when she bumped her head on a low-lying branch, she raced into her house and said, Mommy, Mommy, Joey hurt me. And said, what? Joey hurt me. He hit me in the head, you know? And uh, she said, uh, no, no, he didn't. Oh, he did. No, he didn't. He went to the store with your father and won't be back for about another 20 minutes, <laughs> you know? And then the little girl said this. Does that mean that stuff like this can happen on its own at any time and there's no one to blame? Mother said yes. And then she goes, whoa, bummer. <laughs> yes, bad things can happen at times. And sometimes there's not a reason, and sometimes there's not somebody you can blame. And that's one of the hardest things for us, isn't it? When bad things happen, to try to, we want to put it in a nice little box and wrap it up in such a way that it makes sense. But sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Do you know that Jesus asked over 300 questions as recorded in the Gospels? Uh, he only answers three questions himself. But he raised a lot of questions. And today we get to one of those questions that he does answer. His disciples saw a man born blind and said, Rabbi, who sinned that he was born blind? What was the cause? Did he himself sin while he was in his mother's womb? Or did his parents sin that he was born blind? Isn't that weird? The rabbis taught that you could sin in your mother's womb in such a way that you could cause bad things to happen to you. See, they had it all wrapped up, or the parents somehow sinned. They had it all wrapped up. My friends, sometimes you can't wrap it up very neatly. And sometimes even we Christians try to do that and, it's, and it doesn't work well. And sometimes it's even harmful and hurtful. I'm going to put up uh, an illustration here, all right? Uh, it has, you know, like four quadrants or quarters to it, you know? Uh, to the north, if you want to put up that picture there, on the north are, are the two boxes where God allowed bad things to happen. And the south part is God caused bad things to happen. You got that? God allows, God caused. And then on the Western Hemisphere, you could say, it's for punishment, to punish. And on the Eastern Hemisphere, it's for ultimate good, for good. One of these four quadrants is the way most of us think. And sometimes we say things in one quadrant that we uh, unfortunately say it, but people don't hear it that way. Uh, I was a vacancy pastor while I was in one church in, in Connecticut, and an 18-year-old boy uh, was picked up by friends. He had just been drizzling uh, just a few blocks from his house. Uh, the driver of the car did not negotiate a 90-degree turn, and um, they smashed into um, the bumper, the, the side thing. And uh, uh, the boy died instantly uh, because the bumper went right through the guardrail, right, went right through the windshield into his chest. <coughs> now, how do you explain to his parents who had just said goodbye to him for, for a few minutes earlier? How do you, what do you say to parents like that? Sometimes Christians try to be helpful and they really aren't. They say something like, it was God's will. Now, I bet you when you say it's God's will, you meant something in the northern hemisphere, right? God allowed that to happen. But that's not the way those parents would have heard that. They might have interpreted that, that God caused that accident. And they, you might well say it was God's will, thinking that they'll be encouraged to know that in spite of this tragedy, something good will come of it. You know, the Eastern Hemisphere here, you know? 
But that's not the way. It causes agony. If God willed it, is God punish me, me, dad, for my son's death? Or is he punishing his mother for his son's death? Or maybe my son is guilty of something that caused his death. You, know, you hear that? Sometimes we just don't know. And to say it's God's will, oh, next time you're awake, don't say that. Yeah. You're going to say, well, Pastor, what do I say? Do, do I say nothing? Good answer. Good answer. Sometimes we don't have anything we can really say. And there are times where words really fall to the ground at those times. But your presence, especially if they know that you're a child of God, your presence at that moment, your hug at that moment, speaks volumes. So don't think you have to figure it out theologically for your friend. Just be there for that person. So the, the disciples, Lord, who sinned? The baby in the bu this man when he was in his mother's womb? Or did his parents sin that he was born blind? The rabbis teach bad things only happen to bad people. And Jesus doesn't answer that question. He doesn't purposely skirt it. But he says the ultimate end will be for God's glory. I think that's something about something good will eventually come out of this man's blindness. It's something that God will allow to happen for an ultimate good. In this story, you saw the ultimate good was his healing. <clears throat> Jesus did miracles all sorts of different ways. This is the only time he spat on the ground. I think maybe he didn't listen to Mary say, son, it's not polite to spit, you know? He spat on the ground, he made mud, put mud on that. You know, there's another story in the Bible where God used the dirt in creation. I mean, is Jesus insinuating that he is God? Maybe. But every miracle Jesus did was different. He touched people and they were healed. He prayed over people, they were healed. He spoke a word from a distance and they were healed. He makes mud. Why did Jesus do it different every time it seemed like? So that you won't think that it's a formula by which you get healed. That it's ultimately always Jesus who's responsible for healing. And no matter what bad thing happens, we see from this story that God's ultimate purpose is to bring you healing, whether it's physically or emotionally or spiritually. That's the highest good. And you know, in John's Gospel, I know I was taught at seminary that every Bible verse has just one meaning. And I want to tell you, I affirm that like 95% of the way, except when it comes to John's Gospel. John's Gospel has this sneaky way of doing something physical and then bringing something spiritual. He feeds 5,000 people loaves of bread, and then he says, I'm the bread of life. He heals a man, and then he talks about spiritual blindness. And when Judas betrays Jesus, and he goes out, and John says it was night. Yeah, it's physically night, but I think he's also insinuating that the spiritual forces of darkness are now encroaching upon Jesus. Yes, physical healing is wonderful, and physical blindness is terrible. But there's one thing worse, and that's spiritual blindness, blindness in your heart. And I think this story is told with the purpose to make you see that when you do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is not something that you somehow mustered up the courage or the strength or the wisdom to make happen. Just as much as a man born blind cannot see unless a miracle happens. We who are spiritually blind from birth and believe in Jesus, that too is a miracle that can only come from God. Have you ever looked upon yourself as a walking miracle? 
if you trust in Jesus, you're a walking miracle. God has done a wonderful work through his word, through baptism, through Christian parents and Christian friends and all the influences of your life that give you God's word. Give God thanks for those people that were influential in your life that led you to the point that you believe. What I think is interesting about this story, you would think they would have thrown a party for this guy, you know? But all they had was to ask questions. They saw a change, and then the questions came. That shouldn't surprise you. Imagine, if you would, a teenage boy who drives, who drives. He's got a car. The car is usually, uh, looks like the city dump, you know? He's got McDonald's wrappers and, and stale french fries all scattered throughout the car, you know? He's got cups in there, all sorts of stuff in there. The car is just a mess. And then one day, then one day, you look in his car and it's neat as a pen. There's been a change. And whenever you see somebody that's made a change, you want to ask questions, don't you? You know? They ask the man, How is it? are you the man that used to beg? Yes, I'm him, you know? How is it you can now see? They kept asking him questions rather than celebrating. And, and, and again, if you saw your, a change in your teenage son's car, you know that something's up, something up. And so the question you want to ask as a parent is, what's her name? <laughs> Who? What are you talking about, Mom, Dad? What's your girlfriend's name? I didn't tell you I have a girlfriend. You didn't have to, you know? The car gives it away. And Dad's been complaining that his aftershave is almost depleted, you know? What's her name? It's the change that people see in us. As we come to faith, or have been growing in faith, that catches their attention. So like Jesus said, don't put your light under a barrel or a bushel, you know, let it shine. Let your good work shine that others might ask you questions, but ultimately give glory to your Father in heaven. Change does happen when Jesus Christ enters your life. When you recognize that you believe in Jesus and it's all because of God that motivates you to want to live for God. And that's so selfishly. There's a book about baseball. And in this book, the author tells about Earl Weaver. He was the former manager of the Baltimore Orioles. And uh, sports fans will know that... Um, how, will enjoy how Weaver handled uh, Reggie Jackson when he played on that team. Uh, Weaver had a rule that no one could steal a base unless he gave the signal for one of the coaches. That upset Jackson because uh, he felt he knew the pitchers and he knew the catchers that he faced quite well, that he himself could make judgment whether or not to steal and who he could steal off of. So in one game, he decided he would steal without the signal. And he got a good jump off the pitcher and he easily beat the throw to second base. As he shook the dirt off his uniform, Jackson smugly smiled with delight, feeling they had vindicated his judgment to his manager. Later, Weaver took Jackson aside and explained why he wasn't given the steal sign. First, the next batter was Lee May his most powerful hitter, other than Jackson. And when Jackson stole second, first base was left open so the other team could simply walk the second best hitter and not be threatened with a home run, a double, or another hit. And the second, the founding batter, hadn't been strong against that particular pitcher, so Weaver felt that he could send that guy up with a pinch runner or a pinch hitter to drive in the man on base. But Jackson's action left him without those resources. You see, Jackson saw only his relationship to the pitcher. Earl Weaver saw the whole story, the whole game. At some point in your life, the best thing you can do 
is to be like Johnny Erickson Tata. Do you know the story of Johnny? Johnny was a young girl, about 18 years of age, that took off, uh, took a little dive off. Her, she and her sister were swimming in the Chesapeake Bay, and she took a dive off the pier and hit her head on a rock below. She became a quadriplegic. Her story is told by Billy Graham in a movie. She wrote a book. You can buy her artwork because she draws with her teeth, you know. And the whole movie and book is about her struggle to, to figure out why did this bad thing happen to her. She asked God, where were your angels? Don't I have a guardian angel? Was he, was he on break? Was he sleeping that day? Where was my guardian angel? They say that you're a God of love, you know. Why did you let this happen to me? You know? And the whole movie is pretty much about that, her struggle and the struggle of others to understand what had happened. I told you she could draw with her teeth, right? She could brush, but she could also do pencil drawings. Her friends took her drawings and her paintings to a bar and brought her in one day, and she was aghast. All her paintings were lined up around the room, and they were for sale. They were having an art auction, you know? And she objected, you know? But they said, you know, you do good work, you know? And people were buying with high dollars for these paintings. And, um, well, there was a man who had served in the armed forces there. I think he was in the army. Uh, two claws for hands and a patch over his eye. He had been injured in the war. And he asked Johnny if they could have lunch. And in the movie, it's a very powerful scene, very sweet scene. When the guy said, you know, nobody told us, you know, when we signed up for life that this could happen to us, you know? And uh, obviously, he was going through a tough time. And Johnny Erickson said, I don't know why, and I don't know my future, but I know who holds my future. I know who holds me in the palm of his hand. And then she realized, you know, until this moment, I didn't want to acknowledge it. But I know I'll be okay because I belong to Jesus Christ. I don't know why bad things happen. I can't put it in a nice little box. But I do know who holds your life in his hands, and that's in Jesus. He holds your life in his nail-scarred hands. And those scars on the cross show how much he cares for you and how he forgives you all of your sins and how he has won a place for in heaven. And so, because of Jesus on the cross, God may allow bad things to happen, but ultimately our highest good is to be with him forever. May that encourage you in some way this day in Jesus' name. And now may peace mount guard like a, like a guard at the doorpost of your heart and keep it fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.